So uh, I have a few announcements today. If you haven't done so already, please sign up for the AD2, Analog Discovery 2, distribution during your lab section. There's an announcement that went out from Canvas. If you didn't see that, check out the announcements heading on Canvas. You'll see the link to sign up on a spreadsheet. So what we're gonna do is during your lab section, we'll, we'll uh, uh, take payment, hand out the, the AD2 kit, and I will send more information about that once I have it. I, I expect to have that tomorrow evening. I'll give you the exact location. The latest price I have on it is 195.08. And the mechanical engineering department is handling this. It will be either uh, check or cash exact change. That's what they handle. I'd advise not to write the check yet because I want to confirm after the first kit is sold tomorrow uh, in a different lab section. There's another class buying uh, this kit. I want to confirm that's the, the right price. Um, and I'll send out the exact location. It's going to be near the Idea Forge. Uh, if you know where that is, I'll send out a map. Uh, and I'm waiting on info, info about the computer, I'm sorry, the component kits through electrical engineering. That's coming up too. I was unable to get those combined. So after you get your kit on Friday, uh, I'm gonna ask you to work the Lab One tutorials. They're, they're pretty easy. I'll show you an example today. I'll do a little demo of it. So I don't think you're gonna need the lab session. It'll be pretty quick. It's just hooking up your AD2 and starting up the software and uh, doing a, a couple measurements per a tutorial. And so let's see, assignments coming up. Homework one is coming up. Don't forget that Wednesday, I think 4 p.m. is the due time. There's a pre-lab, I'll show you that. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, due this Thursday and then quiz two is due Friday. So the TAs have posted office hours on Canvas. Take a look at the course information page. You'll see their times and then they're going to use their Zoom links for lab in order to hold office hours so we don't have to have too many links. So take a look at that on Canvas. Clicker grading. So clicker grading through iCloud is not working completely for me. Some of you may have grades if you answered. Some, you, some of you may not have grades. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'm going to do a manual upload and uh, get that straightened out. So it's not right at this point. And as always, my office hours will be right after class, so stick around if you want to ask questions or just listen to other people's questions and answers. And also, as always, uh, ask questions during class. I will try to see the, the little tiny chat window over here that doesn't always catch my attention. If not, just unmute and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Otherwise, please stay muted so that we can keep the background noise down. And if I drop off during the lecture due to technical issues, stick around, I'll try to get back. Okay, so what I wanted to do <clears throat> is this. I wanna show you the uh, pre-lab. So this is the pre-lab. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy. This is pre-lab one. It's basically getting your kit and up here in the upper right, reading uh, some information about, about the AD2 on, on this link. And then down at the bottom, there are some questions. Again, um, just basic stuff, just to make sure you understand what a waveform generator is and what an oscilloscope does. So uh, straightforward stuff. Uh, what you'll do is you'll actually turn this in. So you'll circle your answers, print this out, circle your answers, and submit it to the, the uh, Dropbox under the assignment on Canvas. And then there's actually a problem where you'll look at the measurements on a voltmeter and an ammeter and calculate the power using the passive reference configuration. So it shouldn't take you that long. Uh, that's that's due uh, this, this Thursday. And then, whoop. There's also uh, lab one. So this is lab one. And lab one is going to ask you to install the software for the AD2 and do a couple tutorials. So these tutorials are through Digilent, the manufacturer, and they're, they're pretty good, so I didn't make up my own. Um, and you'll insert screen captures. So what you're gonna do is for lab, you download this Word file, 
your report actually is this file and you will do what it says wherever you see a diamond that's something that you you have to pay attention to that's something you have to do um, and then you'll insert for example a screen capture uh, of your first measurement in here so take a screen capture here's some photos on what you're going to be connecting and then so you're going to connect a waveform generator to an oscilloscope and also a power supply to a voltmeter just to get the basic functions running. And that'll be a good start for the AD2. And then you'll submit this file uh, to Canvas under this assignment. Question. Yes. If we choose to work on this lab this Friday, uh, is there a potential safety risk or is it all something we can do on our own? Oh, absolutely. This is something you do on your own. This is not meant to do uh, together with anybody this Friday. The, the um, unavoidable risk, I guess, is actually picking up the, the, the kit at this point with our processes. But as soon as you get your kit, you're going to split and uh, go do this on your own. All right. Great. Okay. And this assignment, this lab actually isn't due until the following week. So you have uh, until just before the next lab, the following Friday, to do this. Okay, so let's see. So that's the uh, lab and the, the pre-lab. Uh, let me just bring up something here. So I'm gonna show you the uh, AD2. So you should see on the screen right now, let me focus. So, so this is what you're going to get, and for your lab, one part of your lab, you're actually going to connect the a waveform generator, which creates AC waveforms to a an oscilloscope. So what I've done here is this orange wire and this uh, orange wire with a white stripe. That's the oscilloscope that measures voltages, gives you a plot of voltage versus time, and then this, uh, if you could see it, the yellow wire and the black wire are actually connected to the waveform generator in the AD2. And so whatever voltage you define for the waveform generator shows up across these, these two wires. So you'll get these header pins, you can connect, uh, connect wires together directly. Uh, you'll also use a breadboard uh, in, in a later lab, but this is a quick way to get started. So let me show you the, the software uh, really quickly. So it's the software called Waveform. So this is the Waveform software. And uh, what I'll do is let me just start up a, a Waveform generator. So this is actually running on the hardware that you see in, in my little image there. Um, in the Waveform generator, you can create sine waves or square waves or triangle waves, right? Let's, let's do a sine wave. Uh, you can set the frequency. Let's set the frequency to five kilohertz, for example, or you can set the period of the wave. Um, you can set the amplitude, let's change it to two volts. You can set a DC offset and some other characteristics of the waveform. Um, so if you hit run, uh, this waveform is being created at the yellow and black wires that I showed you. That's a voltage there. This isn't actually the waveform measured. This is what the waveform generator thinks it's creating. It's just a visual display of what you set over here on the left. If I want to measure that, what I can do is come up here to the welcome window and click on scope and an oscilloscope uh, window is created. So this is measuring the voltage between the orange wire and the orange with white stripe wire. You've got to hit run to get it to run, but once I hit want run, you'll see the sine wave is created. And you've got the yellow measurement, that's channel one. The blue measurement is channel two, but I don't have anything connected. So that's just noise there. Um, I can I can use on the right these controls to zoom in or zoom out on the horizontal or vertical axis, or I can put my mouse over here at the bottom and zoom in and zoom out. And I'm not actually changing the wave, I'm just zooming in on the plot. And the same thing over here, I can put my mouse over here and zoom in and zoom out on that uh, waveform. I can come down here on the waveform generator and you know change the frequency to two kilohertz, and I can change the uh, you know, the waveform to a square wave or a, or a triangle wave, right? So on the bottom, that's what the waveform generator thinks it's creating. On the top, that's what it's uh, uh, actually, that's what's actually being measured on the oscilloscope, okay? Uh, you'll see 
in the lab, you'll create a, a, a voltmeter. So here's a voltmeter and um, it, it, <clears throat> when you run it, it'll show the, uh, the voltage measurements and you'll also create a supply, power supply. So the power supply is over here on the right. So this power supply lets you set a voltage, let's say four volts and enable or disable that power supply. And then don't forget to turn the power supply on. You actually have to come up here and hit the master enable on in order to turn on the power supply. Okay, so it's kind of a quick overview of the software. Uh, it's, it's a pretty cool little device, really powerful software to, to do measurements, actually better than some of the lab equipment I've been using on the bench. So just want to give you a, an intro uh, on that. Also see the video, there's a video um, under the lab one assignment page uh, that, that shows this if you need any help with it. Um, and of course the TAs and I will be available for office hours uh, if you need some help with it. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, professor? Yes. So I have two questions. So first is, so why is it that the waveform generate, why is there like a difference between what the waveform generator like thinks it's generating and what the oscilloscope picks up? Is that just difference? Oh, them? so, so it's, it's the same here. I'm just on a different time scale, right? Um, but, but some differences might be some noise. For example, if I, if I come here and let's, let's do a square wave. Oops. Let's do a square wave here. I'll show you an, I think this will work. Um, See, the waveform generator thinks it's generating a perfectly square waveform, but some interesting things, things happen with the inductance of the wire. If I go up to a high frequency, let's go up to like 50 kilohertz and zoom in here. So you can kind of see there's some overshoot in here. Uh, it kind of it comes up, overshoots a little bit, and then comes back down and reaches a steady state. So what the waveform generator thinks it's generating is a perfectly square waveform. And, and again, at higher frequencies, you'll notice this more. Let's go up to 100 kilohertz. Um, uh, but, but because of external electrical real analog factors, um, the waveform might not be exactly at, at its terminals what the waveform generator thinks. Okay. When you say like real life situations, is that just cited kind of like impurity in the generation process? It's both. It, oh, I'll say both. It's impurity in the generation process um, because this is created by an, a, a digital to analog converter and it's not perfect. Um, and also uh, in, in real world circuits, you have wires that aren't, uh, they aren't perfectly conductive. They have some resistance, very small amount, but they have some. They also have some inductance and some capacitance. And so what that causes is um, a frequency response that doesn't perfectly let high frequencies pass, or it might cause some ringing in a circuit because of some inductance and capacitance resonating. So yeah, there's lots of real world factors. At low frequencies, it doesn't matter that much when you're below a megahertz, maybe 100 kilohertz. Um, once you get up above 10 megahertz, and I'll say especially when you get up to 100 megahertz, those factors start coming into play. Wires don't look like wires anymore. They look like inductors and capacitors, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to first order circuits. Okay, and uh, my other question was, and, and forgive me if this seems a little fundamental, but um, in the video that you uh, told us to watch before our intro lab last week, um, so you said that the like DC power generator is like a source of power. Is the uh, AC waveform generator also a source of power? It is a source of power. So typically, typically the, the, the power supplies are used to power your circuits. In other words, um, they're used to apply a voltage to a chip, an amplifier, um, in order to make something happen. The, um, the AC waveform, the waveform generator, it's usually used to create something like a square wave that causes a microprocessor to execute its instructions or a sine wave to do a test of a filter. It does deliver power, like you have to deliver power in order to um, sense or, or use a signal, but its primary function isn't, I'll say, to, to supply power to cause, um, like to make your circuit uh, uh, operate. It's more of a signal that's used as an input to see what, see what happens, maybe output versus input. 
Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay. The difference is kind of like your, uh, let's see, uh, your computer. Your computer, you plug it into a wall outlet. That's really, now it's AC, but it's, that's really what's powering your computer. It's making, it's, it's making it function um, versus your Ethernet cable um, or your USB cable. That's not used to, well, your USB would power your phone. But let's say your Ethernet cable. That's not used to power anything, but, it, but it's sending an AC waveform that contains information on it, and, and that involves delivering energy. So there is power there. Okay. All right. Good questions. Um, okay, so let me, so you'll see that when you get to the, get to the lab. And so what I want to do now is uh, continue on with circuit analysis fundamentals. Let's go back to where we ended last time, and that was uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law. So we talked about KVL. I defined what a loop was. Uh, I defined some voltages on this example circuit. And then I talked about writing KVL equations around each one of these loops. And if you hit a plus, write a plus. If you hit a minus, write a minus. And that is a really uh, uh, good way to do it because I think it minimizes mistakes. So let's do a little practice now. I'm going to bring the clicker over onto the screen here. Let's do a clicker question. Okay, so here's a uh, here's a circuit. Doesn't matter what those circuit elements are; they're just circuit elements. And I have a couple voltages defined with values, and then one variable defined with reference polarities. So give this a shot. If if you want to define VC, I'd suggest using K VL. Kirchhoff's voltage law. Uh, what is VC? Take about 30 seconds and give that a shot. I'm sorry, Professor, my computer's taking a little bit to connect to Reef. Oh, there it goes. Take, take another 30 seconds and give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, let me know if you have any problems uh, ever. Okay, if you haven't uh, figured it out, take a guess, get your participation credit on this, and I'll call time. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, let's write a KVL equation. Now, you can start at any node and you can go in either direction. So I could start, let's say, up at the top and say minus six plus VC plus a negative two equals zero. I could start here on the right and go the other direction. Minus VC plus six minus a negative two equals zero. Once you get back to the starting point, don't forget the equals zero part of it. And so what I chose to do here is actually uh, start at the lower left of this circuit. So uh, plus six minus a negative two minus VC equals zero. And so you wind up with uh, eight volts. All right. Any questions on that? So like if we were thinking in terms of maybe hooking up a battery to two light bulbs, is there kind of a convenient way? Because I, I guess I'm still struggling with the negative and where you... Uh, so if you run into a plus, you add it. I guess I've always done it if you have a six volt battery and then the other side of the equation has to equal the six volt drop. So is there a way of relating this in with the negatives back to kind of that line of thought you can i mean you could you could actually you could actually draw a battery connected to a light bulb and 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 i would put the uh the voltage with the positive side on the on the same node so that you could say the light bulb light bulb voltage equals the battery voltage um you know i'd be happy to let me let's do this if you want let's join uh and anybody who wants to join this i'd be happy to make out a few 
KVL problems with like two components or one component with lots of negative signs and no negative signs. And if you want to join at office hours, um, let's do that then. How about that? Thanks. Sure. Yeah, it lets me spend some more time uh, talking about that during office hours. I like to kind of defer it to there, to that time. So let's talk about network reduction. Network reduction is a term that means turning a complex circuit into an equivalent simple circuit, usually for the purposes of easier analysis or, or maybe uh, reducing the number of components in a circuit um, or maybe getting a particular value of a resistor, let's say, if you don't have a standard value that is what you need. Um, let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's say this is uh, a complex circuit. It's not that complex, but you have several circuit elements, and I've defined two terminals on the right, terminal A and terminal B, uh, at, as, as some point where you could measure or maybe connect to another circuit. If, so this circuit could be expressed as a simpler circuit, maybe, right? We have to look at it. Often they can be expressed as a simpler circuit or even a single component uh, between those two terminals. So what that means is that between terminals A and B, these circuits behave the same way as seen from the outside. Okay, what do I mean by that? If you put a box, if I take the circuit on the left and I put it in a box and I expose two wires, A and B, and I put X in a box and I expose A and B, if these circuits are equivalent, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference from the outside world. You could connect a battery, you could connect a voltmeter and ammeter, and they would look the same from the outside world, from outside the box. Series and parallel combinations of components are one way of doing this, and I'll show you what series and parallel means um, next. But we're going to work with, uh, there are a, a couple topics in class where we will deal with equivalent circuits. And what it means is you couldn't tell the difference between the circuits if you put those two circuits in different boxes and I handed you those circuits. Is there a benefit to building one over the other? Um, well, let's suppose you need a 1002 ohm resistor, right? You're not going to find a 1002 ohm resistor. So for example, you could take a 1000 ohm resistor, put it in series. We'll talk about this with a two ohm resistor. And now you have an equivalent 1002 ohm resistor. So there's there's things you can do like that. There's also, we're going to get to Thevenin equivalence, where if you look on the back of your stereo or audio amplifier, there's a there's an impedance. There's It says like 8 ohms or 16 ohms or 4 ohms. That has to do with an equivalent circuit that we're going to cover in Thevenin equivalence when we get there. So, uh, so series, now you may have just kind of a feel for series equivalent circuits and maybe parallel circuits, but, but let me encourage you to take a look at this definition because sometimes it's hard to tell. And if you apply this definition, uh, it works. So, uh, so circuit elements are in series when the same current flows through them. So if I have two circuit elements and I could envision current flowing through A, that same current would also flow through B. It has nowhere else to go in between A and B. So the, those circuit elements are in series. Now, if there's no current flowing, they're still in series uh, because if you had current flowing through one of them, it would also, that current would flow through the other. So parallel is this. Parallel uh, is defined uh, by this statement, circuit elements are in parallel when they connect to the same two nodes. So if I have two circuit elements, A and B, and I, I connect them, them as shown here, make it so my arrow is always visible, I connect them as shown, um, A connects to this top node and the bottom node. Remember, the node is the entire connection uh, between circuit elements. So A connects between the top node and the bottom node. B connects between the top node and the bottom node. They share the same two nodes, so they are in parallel. Okay, so, so remember that. We're gonna do another clicker question next. Uh, 
when you ask if two elements are in series, remember this definition, same current flows through them. In parallel, they connect to the same two nodes. Okay, okay so let's try this. So looking at these circuit elements, you have eight circuit elements here. Circuit elements one and two, are they series, parallel, or neither? Okay, take 10 more seconds, get your response in. Okay. All right, so um, you ask yourself, well, one and two, uh, do they connect to the same two nodes? Well, no, one, uh, number one connects between this kind of left node and this top node, two connects between this left node and the bottom node over here. And uh, so they're not in parallel, but if you can envision current flowing through these elements, if current flows through element one, then that same current would flow through circuit element two. So they are in series. Okay, let's try another. Uh, so five and seven, series parallel or neither? Okay, take 10 more seconds. Okay, well again, you ask yourself those same two questions that follow the definitions. Um, five and seven, seven uh, do they have uh, the same current flowing through them? Well, I would claim no, because if current flows down through seven, it goes through eight, it splits up through five, it might go up through four, so the current is definitely not the same. Do they connect to the same two nodes? Uh, no, seven connects to these right corner nodes, five connects to these top and bottom uh, center nodes here. Okay, so these are uh, neither in series nor parallel. Okay, all right, let's try this one, three and five. Professor, I have a quick question. Sure thing. Um, on that last clicker question, just to clarify, a node doesn't have to be like an intersection of wires? That's right. We define a node to be the whole connection uh, between among circuit elements. Okay. So, so what I'm, if you can see my mouse now, what I'm circling right now, right, that, that is this top center node to which elements one, three, four, five, and six are connected. So that's considered one node, not just like the, the T or, 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 you know, just a junction between two wires. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. So let's take a look at this one. Uh, let's see, three and five. So three and five both connect between this top node uh, and this bottom node. So they are in parallel. Okay, let's try a couple more here. Six and eight. Okay, take five more seconds, get your answer in. Okay, so six and eight, you ask yourself, do they connect to the same two nodes? Mm, no, they don't. Uh, six connects to this upper right node and the top node, eight to the lower right node and the bottom node here. Um, does the same current flow through them? I would claim yes. If you have current flowing through 
element six, you also have that same current flowing through circuit element eight. So these circuit elements are in series. Okay, and one more. Three, four, and five. Okay, it looks like folks are getting a handle of this because I see the, the responses increase faster compared to the first problem. That's good. That's refreshing the page, it's harder to respond. Sure. Oh, say that again? I just, on my phone, I have to keep refreshing if I want the problem to actually come up. Oh, really? Okay. And let me know if, if you have answered your clicker question and you don't get credit for it, definitely let me know. You're not going to be penalized because of uh, apps not working properly. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So three, four, and five, they all three of those connect to two common nodes. Okay, the top node and the bottom node, so they are all in parallel. So more than two elements, circuit elements, can be in series or parallel um, mutually. All right, any questions on series or parallel? Okay, good. Wait, hold so, on. Oh, sure, go ahead. There's a couple of chat questions. Oh, see my chat window. Where did my chat window go? Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. For some reason, I cannot answer the question. So if you, uh, so let me know. Maybe either shoot me an email or uh, join office hours, and we'll work out any problems you have with with using your. Uh, I clicker reef. Does this only apply when the circuit elements have the same resistance? No. Circuit, so two resistors can have, let's say, two different values, 500 ohms and 1000 ohms. And those resistors, you can put them in either series or parallel. And actually, we're going to, we're going to, talk about how the current and voltage splits among series and parallel resistors. Yeah, okay, so that would affect, you're saying, uh, that would affect how current gets split between them. I see, I um, got your second statement there. So when I say, let me go back to that um, slide. Okay, let's, let's consider here circuit element four and circuit element seven. They are neither in series nor parallel. They don't share the common node nodes. They don't have the same current going through them. By same current for series, I mean this. I don't mean the same value of current. I don't mean like if four has two milliamps and seven has two milliamps, hey, they have the same value of current. That does not make them um, in, in, in series, okay? The uh, four and seven would have to actually, if you could, if you could, if you could put a sticky note on an electron and watch it flow, right? If if that electron flows through seven and then four, or if it eventually would, those would be in series. I'm you know, making that up, but it's not the it's not the value of the current that matters. It's 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 the it's the same current flow, not like. Uh, now, the other is true. If you have the same current, for example, s six and seven, they are in series. If I have two milliamps flowing through circuit element six, and then I'm going to have two milliamps flowing through seven and eight, okay? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about sources. Finally, we're getting to real circuit elements versus, you know, these blocks with letters in them. Um, 
let me give you a brief overview of sources. Here's what they are. Sources are circuit elements that maintain a voltage or current in a circuit. So they cause a voltage or they cause a current to happen. Think of something like a battery. Um, here are some examples of realistic sources, batteries, of course. Um, solar panels, that's a source. Battery chargers, those are sources. Um, signal generators or waveform generators, those are sources. They are a source of voltage or current. So one thing that um, may not be so obvious is this. Sources can actually supply or absorb power. Okay, it's kind of weird that sources would absorb power, but think of it this way. A supply example would be this, a solar panel powering a circuit. That's obviously a source supplying power. But what about a rechargeable battery being charged? A rechargeable battery is a source. It can cause a voltage to happen in a circuit, uh, uh, but it can also absorb power, right? It can, it can absorb power when it's charging. You can divide sources into four different types. And so I'm gonna put the four different types in this quad chart right here. Um, sources can supply a voltage or a current, okay? So you can have a voltage source or a current source. And sources can either be independent or dependent, right? They can be independent, meaning the rest of the circuit doesn't affect their specified voltage or current. Dependent meaning, and we'll get more into this, that source is controlled by some quantity somewhere else in the circuit. There are schematic symbols for each one of those, so here's what they look like. If you see a circle as a source, that is an independent source. If you see polarity in that circle, that's an independent voltage source. If you see an arrow, a reference direction. If you see an arrow inside the source, that's a current source. Okay. The dependent or controlled sources are shaped like diamonds. So if you see a diamond with a polarity inside, that's a dependent or controlled voltage source. If you see a diamond with an arrow, that's a dependent or controlled current source. Okay, so let's walk through these one at a time. Uh, let's look at ideal independent voltage sources. So what these sources do are maintain a specified voltage across their terminals. Okay, so let's draw one out as a schematic symbol. So here is a, an independent, this is an ideal independent voltage source with a specified value of 12 volts. What that means is that connected to its terminals, or if you took a voltmeter and measured across its terminals, you would see 12 volts. So um, and if you connected a circuit element with two terminals, you would have 12 volts across that circuit element, okay? Let's look at the name. Uh, ideal means that this voltage source maintains a voltage no matter what is connected to its terminals. Well, in this case, except for a, a short, except for a wire, because that would be a conflict between two voltages. Let's put that aside for now. But in theory, this voltage source is ideal because no matter what you connect X to this, uh, 12 volts would be maintained, okay? Eh, that's not too realistic for a battery. If you take a, you know, if you try to start a, a car engine off of, by stacking up uh, 1.5 volt AA batteries, it's not gonna work because, well, batteries are not ideal sources. These get you close. These get you close for analysis purposes and under certain cases for practical sources, uh, they're good models. So let's look at the name further. Independent. These sources are independent because they do not depend, they're not dependent on or controlled by any other voltage or current in the circuit. No matter what's happening throughout the rest of the circuit, uh, you will have 12 volts across the source. Examples. A battery within a normal range. If you take a AA battery, 1.5 volts nominal, um, and you use that battery to supply a few milliamps, then within a normal range, within these few milliamp range, you will see 1.5 volts across that battery. A function generator or a waveform generator, uh, within a normal range, if you're connecting uh, something that draws very little current connected to these terminals, you will see 
this function generator behave as an AC uh, voltage source. So the top example is a DC source, the bottom example is an AC source. Okay, so that's an ideal independent voltage source. Let's talk about an ideal independent current source. So an ideal independent current source maintains a specified current through itself. So here is the schematic symbol. This current source has five amps specified for it, meaning it is going to have, it's going to cause whatever it needs to do. It's gonna cause five amps to flow. Now, obviously this, maybe not so obviously, this, this has to be connected to some circuit or another circuit element for that current to go somewhere because five amps will be flowing out of that top terminal. It has to go somewhere. So in connecting, let's say one circuit element X, you would have five amps flowing out of the source into X in this direction and then back to the source. The source, this current source is ideal because it maintains a specified current no matter what is connected to its terminals, except for an open because current can't flow through an open. Uh, so, so no matter what you connect, X or another circuit, five amps will flow through this source. The source is independent, again, because it's not dependent or controlled by any other voltage or current or anything else in the circuit. I'll show you what a controlled source looks like next. So examples, a constant current battery charger. If you've ever charged a battery of your car with a device that looks like this, where you clip onto the battery, many of these are constant current. So this one you could select uh, six volts or you can, oh, I'm sorry, six amps, or you could select two amps. And as from a dead battery that may have uh, less than 12 volts across its terminals, as you charge it, the battery voltage actually goes up. But even though the voltage is changing across the battery, the battery charge is going to maintain a specified current, meaning it's going to change its voltage to maintain a constant current. Power supplies often have a current limit setting and you can set up a lab bench power supply to cause a certain current to happen in this case. Uh, I, if I had two amps set as a current limit, I could cause this device to be a, uh, an ideal independent current source within reason, right? Isn't that what a control panel is in a house? By control panel, you mean like a service panel where your breakers are? Right. Well, the, so breakers in your house, what they do is they, they when, when they measure um, current over a certain value, let's say 15 amps, if you cause 16 amps to flow through that circuit breaker, they open up. They're like a switch that automatically opens up and stops current from flowing. So I wouldn't call them a constant current source. They're actually more like a current uh, protection device. Um, these, these devices will, will, no matter what you connect to these terminals, you will have uh, their specified current flow. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at controlled sources. Let's start with an ideal dependent voltage source. These sources are controlled by some other current or voltage in the circuit. That's a little weird, but I'll show you examples. So here is the schematic symbol. The specified value for this voltage source is nine VX. VX is somewhere else in the circuit. I'm not even showing where it is. It's somewhere else in the circuit, but it has a value. This voltage source in some way knows what that other voltage VX is and uh, causes nine times VX to happen between its terminals. I'll show you some examples, but Let's just stick with the theory for now. Um, well, here's a, here's kind of a, here's a, I'll say a common example, um, kind of consumer electronics example. An audio amplifier is, is uh, it acts like a voltage controlled voltage source. So you have an input where you might plug in the audio connection from a phone. You have an output that you connect to a speaker and the output voltage is bigger than the input voltage. In fact, it tracks. You might at a certain volume level, the output might be 10 times the input level of voltage. Okay, so, so the, the source would be the 
voltage source that's driving the speakers. And it would be, let's say in this case, 10 times, right? If I have the volume at a certain level, 10 times whatever the voltage is at the audio input. Um, a controlled, a, so another type of vo controlled voltage source is a current controlled voltage source. And so this source, it has the diamond, it has the polarities, but its specified voltage is equal to some function of a current. So on the left, a voltage was controlling the voltage. On the right, a current is controlling the voltage. So somehow this source knows somewhere else in the circuit through some other wire, um, it knows the current and it's going to produce 11 times IY for this particular source. So an example is the type of amplifier that I will show you that um, is used in photodiode light sensors. So we'll take a look at that uh, in a few lectures. Okay, uh, let's take a look at ideal dependent current sources. I just showed you voltage sources that were controlled. Let's take a look at current sources. These current sources are controlled by some other current or voltage in the circuit. So here is a dependent current source. It's the diamond, diamonds is dependent. Um, and Here's the arrow, that means it's current source. It's specified current is IS times, uh, I'm sorry, IS is equal to, it's specified current is three IX. So it's going to have three IX flowing through it. That current is controlled by another current IX. An example is a bipolar junction transistor. So this, this transistor, um, we're going to take a look at these. We're going to study these when we get to the electronics section. But you can see currents, if you can see this on your screen. There's a current called IC, and there's a current called IB. And so the current IC is controlled by IB. IC is equal to some number times IB. Okay, so this is a practical example of a current controlled current source. A voltage controlled current source does this, it's still a current source, but its specified value is controlled by some voltage somewhere else in the circuit. And so this is a practical example. We're not going to take a look at field effect transistors, uh, but once you get a handle on bipolar junction transistors, it's pretty easy to make the leap to field effect transistors and you can just Google it. And uh, once you know EJTs, you'll know FETs. Um, so this type of transistor controls its drain current, like the current coming down through its drain, down through itself to the source, based on the voltage between the gate and the source. You don't have to know that, it's just an example that the gate source voltage controls the drain current. Okay. So those are uh, sources, and let me give you a summary just to put that all back together. You have current sources and voltage sources, and they can be independent or dependent, right? So four kinds. And then the dependent sources can be controlled by either uh, voltage or current. Okay, so those are the types of sources uh, you'll be working with. Uh, professor, I have a question. Yes. Will we go into more detail on like how exactly um, dependent voltage and current sources are controlled by another voltage or current? We will. When we get to transistors especially, I'll show you how, and we'll talk a little bit about the semiconductor physics, how the base current controls the collector current, which is, uh, which is this source down here, a current controlled current source. So we'll get to that. Um, and, and it's a good question. You know, we're, we're in the circuits part of the course. And in the circuits part of the course, we draw these schematic symbols and uh, we don't say how they work, right? We just say, um, you know, trust us, these exist, you can make them work. And that's kind of on purpose because what you need to know before you get into actual devices, you kind of need to know the circuit theory. You gotta be able to do KVL, KCL, understand voltage and current, calculate power and work with these sources. Once we get a handle on, on the circuit theory part of the course, 
then we're going to move on to a few electronics uh, devices. And that's why the course is circuits and electronics. There's different circuits is more theory on paper with schematics and uh, in electronics, you get into the devices themselves. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Okay, well, we've we've hit the wall on time here. It is now 6.10 and I, I have to write this. I, it's so hard to <laughs> know what time the class starts and end when it doesn't start on the hour. Uh, sorry, I have, a, I have a cheat sheet here. So um, in closing, uh, please sign up for a time slot for this Friday to pick up your, your kit. More info to come on the exact location of picking up your AD2 kit. And, um, and then I also will announce the kit pickup from the EE department. That will actually be through the EE store and I'll send out info on that. Uh, check out the assignments and the schedule on Canvas. Uh, so there are some assignments out there. Also see the Slack uh, workspace. I've noticed uh, and I've answered and others have answered questions on the Slack workspace if you have any questions about homework or, or lab. Um, and so that's it for announcements. Uh, thanks for joining the class. Um, I hope everything's working out well with remote learning. And let me know if anything isn't. Again, shoot me an email, stop by office hours, um, and, and I'm happy to fix it if I can.